Okay, everybody, it is the 17th, and I'm back. It's about 6 o'clock in the afternoon here. I finally got my uh, <clears throat> life in order as, as it pertains to um, internet. I, I finally got an internet thing going here that's pretty good. So I, and my, I, I apologize for my last or maybe all of my recent... Uh, efforts because I, I didn't have any connection. I had less than one Mbps, uh, which is terrible. I, it's a funny story and maybe one that we'll be able to follow up on because I, I'm i with a company called Pathfinder and I ended up writing a letter to the president and he contacted me from Florida where he was giving a talk about cybersecurity to uh, Chase Manhattan Bank and, and uh, I guess my letter was compelling enough that he wrote me back or uh, called me back and and uh, um, we had a nice chat <laughs> about <laughs> how his company was doing. And anyway, they sent some people out and hooked me up, dude. It is awesome. I've got some good connectivity now. So uh, the squeaky wheels, uh, that's a phrase. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Did you ever hear that one? I use a lot of old phrases, and uh, my wife always says, God, what is wrong with you? People don't understand that crap. But anyway, the squeaky wheel sometimes does get the grease. Um, quickly, I'm going to... Uh, I am going to go through these discussions, and uh, I'm, I'm texting my child. No, I'm online. Um, and, and I'm, I want to go over this stuff with you just, just to give you my take on it. I, I, like I said, I really love your reading and your, your writing and all that kind of stuff. And, and so, um, but I, I sort of wanted to let you know, uh, what I was thinking when I wrote this, when I wrote what you see on the screen, or I'm pointing at the screen. Um, I have two screens going here, if you didn't notice, um, you know, when I wrote, I knew this summer was going to be one of uncertainty. Even since two weeks ago, I don't know if you noticed the Atlanta shooting. I'm sure you, you know, I mean, you have to live in a cave. But that seemed egregious um, by that cop. And again, you know, I, I stood around with a good old friend from, from uh, who's in recovery also and, and uh, this guy is sort of a pillar in, in our community now, and, and uh, he was a badass in his day. And um, let me just leave it. His his rap sheet made that guy's Floyd's look like a you know joke. And uh, he's a he's a recovered alcoholic now, and and uh, um, a well respected businessman. And, and we were talking about it, and. Um, we have areas of agreement and, and we, we talk uh, very specifically because, of course, I'm on the board of the local mental health hospital, which is Mind Springs, and, and he's uh, very active in, in a, um, a, a volunteer capacity, uh, not only with, with our organization, but with, with uh, someone wrote a grant and got about a half a million bucks in the Roaring Fork Valley to fight what it, the quote unquote opioid crisis. And I, I, I put quotes around it very carefully because I, I want to mention something clearly that, that I believe, and, and um, scientifically I think this is true, is that uh, I'm one in 10. I, if, if you drink alcoholically, I, I, you know, you, if you start drinking in college and, uh, <laughs> and, and and 30 comes around and you're still drinking every day or something like that you've got a problem and you, and you can't stop you might be like me and and the, the latest science says that we're about one in ten uh, and and that's you know since man has crushed grapes let's say you know since and every civilization's figured out ways to get messed up uh, whether it be peyote or 
or alcohol or whatever, but I, I'm that one in 10 that has this problem, right? Well, they, the, the black community is no different. They've, they, it's, it is a, a bell curve. It is a distribution of alcoholics. It doesn't know any race, creed, color. Now, uh, American Indians seem to be, uh, my wife is one, seem to be more susceptible to uh, problems with alcohol. Um, but, and, and it's, I, I don't know, I'm, I hate to say this, but I think, I'm pretty sure that Asian people, whenever we have a joke in AA, whenever you see an Asian guy, it's like, hey, how did you get here? And I'm like, shut up, I drank my way here, you know. But uh, nonetheless, um, what I was trying to get to was that uh, the guy in Atlanta who was just shot in the back, and, and I, you know, again, I, it's hard for me to watch these things, but he was drunk in his car and sleeping. Now, who does that? Um, I do. I do. I get to Wendy's and I'm so wasted that I fall asleep in the car. Well, <laughs> now the cops are called and the cops come. What should they have done? And me and this other guy were standing there. We both got rap sheets and, and the, it, we agreed that you, if the guy says, I'm going to walk home, you let him go. And, and he even brought up, uh, uh, his name is Dylan. He, he brought up a, a show he saw. Apparently there's a cops show in Canada. And, and, and that show that if you ever catch, he says it's on YouTube. And, and if you can catch it, it's pretty cool because, uh, the deal is that they, uh, they, they don't, they don't put handcuffs on anybody. They don't do, they don't do anything. So uh, it, it's just a different approach to policing. And he, he brought that up and said, you got to see a cleaver because <laughs> they run into people like us all the time, you know, us meaning alcoholics and, and they, they do everything they can to not escalate it. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I, Again, I, I put this uh, uh, John Haidt up here. I hope you listen to John. Um, th there's uh, John, John's two incompatible sacred values. I put this up there as, as a, a, a lead in for me saying some stuff that's really cringy. You know, so I hope you're with me on the importance of dialogue and heterodoxy. If you think Dr. Haidt is a racist, or some kind of ideologue, I, I think you're, you're you know, welcome to critique his work like anyone else. Um, I think he's a great guy and, and uh, we don't agree on everything, um, especially we don't agree ideologically. I'm much more uh, conservative fiscally, uh, but he, he thinks the Fed can be saved. I don't, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, so anyway, equilibrium price and quantity for every good and service. If this is true, if Murray is right, uh, then um, policing, we can get a, we can get away with uh, uh, as much policing as the market needs. Now, what was great about the question was it sort of asked you, well, what do you think? How should this be adjudicated? Should it be, um, and when I say adjudicate, how should it be worked out? Should it be worked out in the in the um, by government, it sh or should it be worked out by people? Uh, so here's the question: Because government policing is provided bureaucratically, now when I say that, you may have just sort of skimmed over it. But but what I mean is, it was an old joke about committees, and and uh, the joke goes like this: What what is a uh, what is a camel? And uh, everybody looks at you and you go, a camel is a horse made by a committee. And the, the punchline is supposed to say to you that when you get a committee together, you get all kinds of conflict and, and you end up with weird outcomes sometimes. Uh, it's not always true, but so without market prices. So bureaucratically means you, you end up having a town council and if you're in the town of Glenwood Springs, you've got seven men and women who are going to come up with a policing strategy. 
that, and these men and women are supposed to be um, representing everyone and on and on, you know? So you would think that you, you would get a good uh, policing strategy. Now the problem, the other problem with provided bureaucratically is the police themselves have lobbied for and, and through things like unionization and lobbying, they've, they've, and through what I call mission creep, they've lobbied for things that maybe we don't need and got those things codified into uh, rules and, and administrative rulemaking happens in, in our case, in Denver. So, you know, if, if, if the rule is um, one ambulance per X amount of, uh, of population and you don't have that ambulance, you, it, it'll usually be tied to money. And we'll get into this when we get into taxation uh, um, on my next lecture. But do you understand what I'm saying? All of the rules and all of the stupid legislation that maybe either comes out of the federal, uh, the, the, out of Washington or out of these state houses, uh, you don't get to choose what you want to do in your local municipality. Not all the way. It may be a law that all of your cops have to wear uh, certain pieces of equipment and you may think that that goes it's antithetical to your approach to policing I and and let me give you an example I don't think a cop should get out of a car looking like he's ready to go to war I I think that that's wrong now you may argue with me and say well you know they could get shot that way and and, and all this kind of stuff but I I it's to me it sends the absolutely wrong signal i think that um you know police should be community members first and and uh, uh you know some kind of soldier is not what i want it to look like so that's my opinion and, and yours may be different um but because uh because we have no way to to get around those laws and and edicts that come out of uh, that come out of places like Washington, unless you turn your back on Washington and say, "No, we're not doing that. We're going to do it our way." Maybe that's what comes out of this crisis: is that municipalities start to look around and go, "You know what? We got to thumb our nose at at Washington and the State House in Denver and do things the way we think we ought to do them." Um, but again, that's not easy. You know, you want to rip that Band-Aid off. Uh, that's a toughie. So um, we, have, we, we have what I would call producer surplus. There's, there's too much policing. Uh, and and that's, we have, we're having what I would say is a natural reaction to not allowing market forces to work. And, and there's a continuum. And, and if you read uh, all, of, all of what you, what you guys wrote, this is really, you really get that it's a continuum. How much, how little, what should we do? Uh, and that's why people, libertarians like myself, say things like, well, that's why you let the libertarians do it. Um, you know, Karen says here, it's a tricky proposition. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, look, look at just in the last two weeks, the crazy outcomes were happening. Look at, look at what's going on in Seattle. Look at what... Um, you, you know, what, what people are saying, I, you know, of course in Atlanta, that chief of police just quit, you know, there's cops that I was just driving with a friend of mine and we got passed by a Pickens County Sheriff and I was like, speed up. He's not going to pull you over. Um, and, and what I was saying was that the cops are going to pull back. Why would you get out of your car if you're going to get sued or you're going to get fired or you're going to get prosecuted? These are all unintended consequences of, uh, you know, trying to do the right thing. Um, Mariah said that, that there may be some advantages. I've been having discussions with my older sister lately about race, privilege, and police. Uh, I am from, and she still lives in Minneapolis. Very interesting, right? So she's been seeing firsthand the aftermath of the heinous act of police brutality um, that caused the murder of, of George Floyd. Now. Uh, that that's a tough word, you know. Uh, again, 
actus reus, uh, 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 mens reus, and actus reus are very uh, tough. Thing. You you had to prove if you, if you believe this is well premeditated murder in the second degree means he wanted to kill him. Um, that's going to be hard, a, a hard mountain to climb. Uh, when, when everyone, when every news outlet and every pundit and everyone said murder, I was like, wow. Um, I thought we had something called innocent until proven guilty in this country. Um, it, it's sort of ties in with uh, more recently the Me Too thing. Uh, believe all women, you know, that kind of stuff. That's not what this country was founded on as far as law. And when I, when I teach law, I really hammer that home, that the idea of innocent until proven guilty, this is a first. You know, it, it, the Magna Carta came up with this, this innocence until pro it, it, there's not many countries that do it that way. You have to prove your innocence in most countries. No, here you had, they have to prove your guilt. They have to prove that you did it, that, that you had in your mind, you woke up that morning with murder in your mind. And, uh, that's, uh, or, or in, in the case of Kavanaugh, you, you've got to prove that this guy did something, you know, 20 years ago. He doesn't have to prove that he's innocent. Um, that's not how we run things. It's not, that's how they do it in China. You're guilty. Um, wages coming, public sector, the average annual salary, 32, this is tough, 35 to 38. You, you, yeah, Mariah did some uh, research here. That's 30, $35,000. Who do you, speaking of supply and demand, who are you going to get here at that price? So price is important. If, if you want to improve policing, maybe you've got to pay more. Uh, but uh, that's a whole nother can of worms. Um, Mr. Gallego said, very eloquent here. Um, another issue with police departments, receipt and allocation of funds for force receives so much money and that decides what it will give more or less funds to, uh, whether that be militarizing. I'm so glad he mentioned that. I am so against, you know, as a, as a libertarian, I, I, I just don't, when the, the idea that the libertarian has, of course, is part of the non-aggression principle is that when you create that atmosphere of militarization, you end up with guys and women like that, that, that are stepping on people's necks. And even when there was a nurse in the crowd going, Hey, you got to check his vitals. You got to check his vitals. He was telling her to be quiet and all that. This is a bad scene, right? This is, you know, we're in charge. No, you're not. You work for us. That's the, the, the first and for the first principle it's, it's sort of like why when you go to the motor vehicle, is, is it, it's such a terrible ordeal. Well, there's no, no profit motive. There's no, there, there's no supply and demand of, of licensing. There there's should be, there, you know, so there's no motivation to be excellent at what you do or, or uh, client-oriented or anything like that. So again, I, you know, um, market forces aren't perfect. There, there, there is, remember this over and over, the inefficiencies of the market are better than the inefficiencies of the government solutions to what are considered market inefficiencies. That's my mantra. Um, that's what I believe. But the utopia does not exist. The, the argument on the, on the socialist side or the, or the big government side that says, well, you know, the market fails and the market's always a mess and da 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 da. And we admit that there's problems. We, we us free market period people, admit that there's always going to be a rogue cop. There's always going to be an asshole. You can't, you cannot outlaw jerks. It's just not going to happen. So, how much of this are you going to get? And, and what, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and others are saying is we've got way too much. 
it's happening way, way too much. And whether I don't, I, I personally, um, I've read the statistics and, and I've shown you, I don't know if I showed you my, all of my, uh, um, I think this is part of my lecture that didn't, that didn't get through the last time, but I've done nothing but listen to uh, um, black scholars that I respect um, who, who don't crucify the statistics in order to make some kind of leftist point. Um, I don't listen to people like, uh, I, I just don't listen to people with bullhorns who are lying. Uh, Walter Williams is, is I, I mean, just, I, I would cry if I met him, I really. Shelby Steele has been talking for years on this subject. Um, Shelby is great. Uh, you, you know, uh, Glenn Lowry, brilliant, brilliant economist, uh, wrote some amazing books. Listen to him. Uh, he is not some kind of right wing nut. Uh, and neither, of course, is John McWhorter, who, who's over at uh, NYU. Um, uh, this guy's at Brown, for God's sakes. Somebody asked him, what do you tell you? You know, Brown is like the biggest lefty school on the planet. And someone said to him, how do you, do you tell your students these things? He's like, yeah, I'm too old to lie. Screw it. You know, I, I'm done. It's like me. I, I, I could give a shit about your political correctness. I'm just done with it. Uh, I, I don't know. I turned 50 and I uh, just stopped giving a crap. You know, if you get your feelings hurt, I don't know, call the dean. But be careful. I'd love to go to court. Uh, I really would. I would love to, for them to fire me, and then I would take them right to court. And you've heard it right here, um, because I'm the like the only uh, libertarian. Uh, there's one other guy up in Steamboat, uh, and I won't out him, but uh, uh, he's he seems like a great guy. So, but anyway, back to discussions. Um, there's some really great ones. Janine, of course comes in strong. <laughs> well, I do agree that a free, freelance cop and his company might become corrupt. Yes. You know, there's nothing, nothing is perfect. You know, it just never is. Um, those of you who are waiting for the utopia because you read some of the communist manifesto, I, I just don't see it happening. I'm, I'm of the uh, constrained vision. Um, if you're a communist, you're, you're of the unconstrained vision, I, I would think. Um, the government, wealthier neighborhoods, having more police, poorer neighbors, needing more police, of course. You know, it, it's, uh, wouldn't it be better to let these communities decide themselves how much policing they need? Um, in, in, a, in a seedy little town like Glenwood Springs, uh, you know, I, I could see that, the, you know, the the shopkeepers on main street getting together and hires hire somebody to walk the streets from midnight to, to daylight, you know, each night, uh, give them a gun if you want to, but uh, probably not. You just, just the presence is gonna, you know, deter any burglary there. Um, you know, th there's solutions to these things and, and these solutions have been around for a long, long time. Um, the free, uh, Certain extent, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, Luis would only go certain extent when researching benefits provided by private, rather popular term, mail, mall security, right? You know, and, and the, we all know what those guys are, and, and uh, they're somewhat of a joke. Um, but I, I was speaking of police forces in my college career, my first one at the University of Connecticut, I, I was. I got a job at night, and they called it, believe it or not, they called it the uh, escort service. And what we would do, we weren't police. We had radios, and I was a coordinator after a while. But I, So I drove around in a truck, and, and we would um, drop young men and women off with a radio that was hooked up to the police radio. This is a big campus, University of Connecticut, 35,000. It's like a good-sized town. And um, if you wanted to get from the library, which nobody goes to anymore, but nonetheless, back then we did, the, if you were a young woman and you had to go to a section of campus that was dark or whatever, and you wanted someone to walk with you, we provided that service. And, and the idea was to um, uh, you know, reduce sexual assault. And, and mainly, that was, you know, 
and and get people home safe you know um and that was a it, it was a little paid private police force we called it the student patrol and if anything went down you had a radio on you you know and you you weren't supposed to get involved or or you know chase people or do anything weird you you just call it in um it was a great job for me because i i also dispatched for the cops but uh, so I got to know cops before my, before I, the bottle really had me, and I really started to know cops. But <laughs> the last, it was kind of funny, but <laughs> in a weird way. But anyway, I, I learned how cops think, and uh, to a certain extent, you know, what makes, you know, what kind of personality goes into police work and that. And uh, a lot of, in those days, a lot of those cops were Vietnam vets, and uh, so... There's some badass guys there, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I have very mixed feelings. But that was a good thing, that, that student patrol. Uh, Trinity, great. I understand and respect your position. Like, how respectful is that? Decrease of violence implementing private police officers. However, I would like to question your last statement. How would it be more difficult for private police officers to abuse their position of power than for public police officers? Well, as you, I, the the only thing I would say to that Trinity is is what was in the paper yesterday or today, you know, um, the police and their unions, uh, they they lobbied for and got immunity from being sued, and that was a really bad idea. And again, um, that that type of governmental immunity goes to politicians too. Uh, this guy was charged with murder, as you can see. Um, oh, I got to go over to the op-ed page. Let me show you this, this article that talks about what happened in uh, policing. From here to equality, prices, oh, how the war here it is, how the Warren Court enabled police abuse. And uh, Miss Alice just walked in. And uh, the Warren Court, so, so who was Warren? Chief Justice Earl Warren, 1954, right? This is the Supreme Court. He's a Supreme Court justice. Um, Senate Republicans have an opportunity to reverse one of Chief Justice Earl Warren's most pernicious legacies. It means it's lasted a long time and it's hard to get rid of. They seem determined to blow it. Senator Tim Scott, who's leading the majority's police reform efforts, said Sunday that abolishing qualified immunity. Well, what the hell is qualified immunity, which protects law enforcement officers from lawsuits under the law known as Section 1983, is off the table. Police unions, Mr. Scott said, uh, view it as a poison pill. It originated uh, in the Civil Rights Act of 1871. I, I bet you didn't know there was one of those. If you didn't, look it up. Um, so uh, it, it challenges civil rights violations by defendants acting under color of state and local law, not uh, color meaning skin color. It provides the violators shall be liable to their victims. So uh, this is what, in, in the, my eye, no one should have what is called qualified immunity to anything. That's, that's absurd. Like the, the, it's part of the idea of, uh, you know, legislators not having to live by the laws that they create. That's BS as far as I'm concerned. So uh, anyway, I want to get through this. I, you know, again, uh, great responses. Um, police abuse of power has been going on for a while now. I couldn't agree more. Um, I, you know, that was my experience. Uh, I, I was treated very poorly by a lot of police and believe me, I'm, I, I, you know, the point is that the government has no rational way whatsoever to make allocations. The government only knows that it has a limited budget. It allocates its fund and then subject to the full play of politics, boondoggling and bureaucratic inefficiency. This is what CMC does. It's just terribly inefficient. Um, it's it, to the point where you're just shaking your head. Um, but a, a great way to go, Jose, you know, you should always try and 
uh, quote somebody um, that in the reading, you're getting a good grades from me. But as you <laughs> as you go through your academic career, you're not not you don't have to regurgitate everything the prof wants, but you know it just shows that you read the material. Um, Trinity, very, very smart. Trinity, um, would private police be less likely to abuse power? Uh, no. Well, that's a tough. I don't know. They would. Uh, we probably disagree. They would not because free markets provide influence similarly to the government has influenced the public police, as Tate Fegley stated. Uh, just like everyone else, police respond to incentives, um, according to economists. Bruce Benson, the war on drugs did not really start to escalate into what we know today until Congress passed the 1984 Crime Control Act, uh, allowing police to take a cut of the revenue. Oh, God, right? Talk about the wrong incentives. You know, you could keep the boat. You, you know, you can, um, when you make it into a revenue game, do, do you know, as, as a libertarian, I would never, I, I don't believe in things like speed limits. I don't think cops should be out there pulling people over. I think it's crazy. Um, they shouldn't be looking for revenue from, you know, a cop comes to my window and says, do you, do you know why I pulled you over? I feel like saying, I, I always say no. <laughs> why? <laughs> I don't get pulled over much because I go slow. But uh, if, I, if I do, I'm always like, I don't know. But I do know that you work for me. That's how I start them out. And and uh, and they look at you like you're crazy. And I said, no, really, you do. You work for me. So uh, I'm not sure why you pulled up me over, but I'm pretty sure that I don't agree. You know, so let's start with that. And, and we could be friends now, you know. I'm armed. You're armed. You know, <laughs> everything's, we're even. Uh, I don't put up with it. But uh, uh, Trinity, you're absolutely right on that. You know, incentives mean something. Um, so anyway, I, God, I'd love to go through every one of these, you did a great job, um, but I want to move on to the other one and then I'm going to shut up and go do, uh, do another, I'm going to go through some PowerPoints. So let me go over to the other discussion, which is, oops, I don't want that. I want, I want this, look at how many. These discussion things are wild. I had to do a lot of this in my grad work. So, uh, you know, uh, when I started teaching online again, they were like, oh, well, how are you going to do it? I'm like, oh, shit, I, know, I already know how to do it. Um, unfortunately, I wish, I don't know, I'd rather be in the classroom because we can really kick it around. And, and you would be responding to this discussion right now. Okay, D Bastiat. Uh, Bastiat, Bastiat, right? Who was Bastiat? He was a Frenchman, uh, 18, in, in the late 1800s, uh, Bastiat, so famous. I, you know, I, I mean, you never heard of him, you, you know, um, that's not good. Uh, Friedrich Bastiat, um, if you hadn't heard of him before now, it's it's my feeling you've been miseducated, right? Um, 1848, uh, 1850, he was in office in France. Uh, he was a freedom guy, uh, one of my people, French liberal school. Um, so this is, now 1850, remember, we were about to go to war in 1865 over slavery and, and uh, states' rights. So um, he, he was looking at America in, in, in a kind of a new and different way, um, and, and France especially in a, in a new and different way. Um, economic Sophisms and the Candlemaker's Petition, that's a great one. The Law, he wrote this one that I had in my hand in 1850. Um, but the one that I want you to be familiar with is the broken window fallacy. It ruins taxation, okay, which I'm going to get into later in another thing. It ruins it. it, it you can't talk about taxation anymore uh, once you know the broken window fallacy because you've been told all your life that when the government spends money, it creates wealth. And uh, that is just horseshit. 
when the government spends your money that it takes out of your pocket, it's uh, read the broken window fallacy. It, you know, it keeps you from doing stuff. You know, and and I'll give you the example in my life. Um, we're selling this house. Uh, if the Federal Reserve, we bought it in 2007. If the Federal Reserve had not stepped on interest rates, which uh, I call a tacit taxation, because um, if interest rates were normalized, I get to make twice as much money as I usually make, right? Uh, I, or I get to make what I'm supposed to make, you know? So when you lower interest rates, you steal from savers, you steal from me. Uh, and that's not right uh, in, in a moral sense. So I don't get to do things like pave my driveway, um, add on to my shop, which I would have loved to do. I didn't, uh, you know, I walked around with one of my students the other day here. Uh, he's helping me do some stuff and, and he and I, and I kept pointing at stuff and I said, see, the Federal Reserve kept me from fixing that. The Federal Reserve kept me from, you know, uh, putting a fence around the property, the, you know, on and on and on, you know, it, it, because when you have less cash, you, uh, you, you make decisions based on, on that. Um, so, 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 uh, anyway, I, now I want to look through this one. What are price floors? What are price ceilings? I have, and, and the first thing I wrote was some things that I like to interact for price discovery and equilibrium price and quantity. Now that we understand supply and demand, when we do price ceilings and price floors, what happens? Well, in the case of the minimum wage, this is what happens. And, and it doesn't... Um, so it's interesting to me that, that despite all of that, uh, I had a lot of students who went the other way and said, no, we should have. Well, let's see. Um, here's the studies, uh, how the minimum wage hurts people. Um, almost no one works for it anyway. Should we have one? And uh, did this week's reading change your mind? That's, that's really, um, right? Who... Who would not like to make more money, <laughs> says Brian, of course, you know, uh, if, if you knew that your friend was going to be unemployed because you made more money, would you still want to do it? You know, so I alluded to this sort of in, in the Chinese thing where I said, gee, if, you know, if China, uh, if, w once we allowed uh, trade with China, we, we de facto, um, gave them more money you know i mean that that's what happened would you and it's a moral issue would you do that you know to another third world country um so i think that if a manda mandated wage passes, we already have a mandated wage it's just so low it doesn't matter then uh walmart would lay off more people now i saw today that that uh target said, well, we're going to, we're going to go to the $15 minimum wage and aren't we great? You know, it's this virtue signaling bullshit. Um, they were going to raise people like me go, yeah, that's because what the market is, you know, that's you're raising the wage so that, you know, it's either, it's either to get more business or it's, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, I don't see it as we're leading the, you know, leading the charge to better wages. No, you're paying what people are worth. Um, Frederick, uh, uh, Mr. Walker, uh, current population levels, I, I believe a binding minimum wage, such as standard level of income or compensation received, uh, specifically low skilled labor. I'd imagine disproportionately low compensation level and correlation to net profit gains. Um, so, uh, Finding the effects of raising the minimum wage is challenging. 97% of American workers now make above the minimum wage, not because it's a law, but because employers have to pay higher compensation to retain. So um, not only that, right? Uh, I can't remember. Is it is a reduction of Feb? Nevertheless, my primary stance in terms of minimum wage is the reduction of a federally implemented compensation wage, right? And and we did later on um, getting we got into some of the 
uh, I can't remember the Asian guy that was running for a Democratic ticket was talking about a guaranteed um, guaranteed income. Uh, yeah, difference between California and Texas, and incredible. You know, we used to talk about New York City and upstate New York, where I, where my farm was. The wages are incredibly different. So you make a fifteen dollar an hour wage. It just it, one size does not fit all. Uh, I, the minimum wage here in the valley, because housing so expensive, is so much different. Um, it's it's hard to set a federal wage across the board. This is the uh, you know federalism. It, the way federalism was designed was federalism meant uh, in the Catholic Church we got this thing called subsidiarity. You do things at their at their most subsidiary level. So if you're going to have a minimum wage, it should be adjudicated by the town council. That would be the best, or you know, and all that. But once you start talking about subsidiarity, you might as well just let uh, the market do it. So, um, of the individual states, when markets don't achieve efficiency, government intervention can improve society's welfare. That's straight from Krugman. Um, when markets don't achieve efficiency, government intervention can improve society's welfare. Right? Uh, I don't agree. Straight up. I, I've never seen any evidence that, that government intervention has improved society's welfare. If society is everyone, uh, I would say no. I would say it has improved some people's welfare. Not everyone's. When you know, if you create a minimum wage, someone that money comes from somewhere. Uh, the most efficient rate would be a high minimum wage would completely disrupt the market. So again, it's it's one of those things where you say, uh, what's the constraint? If if fifteen dollars is is a, a minimum wage, why not thirty? Why not a hundred? Um, so and, and interesting, Mr. Gallegos uh, uh, already been set on what I believe the government should be doing with minimum wage. Nothing. Uh, mostly, my I don't believe that someone who works for a job that the market finds to be one of the lower end of the pay should be getting double what it would actually be. Uh, the other thing I would add to that, of course, w with all the reading and and, uh, and the libertarian ideal or or the free market ideal, is that. Um, you exclude workers. Um, Milton Friedman, in, in his great book, Free to Choose, I don't have a copy, on, I thought I had it on my desk. In his, in his series, he did a series on PBS called Free to Choose, where they talk specifically about the minimum wage. And he, he uh, Mr. Friedman, and I'm quoting him, it's, it's, it is the most discriminatory law on the books in the United States. And, and he was talking in 1980. He felt that um, the minimum wage discriminated against, in particular, young people and people of color or minorities, if you will. And, and he's right. I, I, empirically, he's correct. Because if, if that guy, uh, you know, that unemployed kid in, in the inner city, if, if, the, if the minimum wage is at 15 bucks, his marginal wage is zero. So now he's on the street. What's he going to do? He can't offer his services. The most important tool you have, and this, this goes to, the, to the, uh, the same thing with women and the wage, the most important tool you have is that negotiation. You know, if you, if, if, if there's, and, and this is specifically for women, if, if there's some, uh, we'll call them, uh, they used to call male chauvinist pigs out there that don't want any women working for them, they will pay a price for that discrimination because me, I'm down the road. I'm going, I'm hiring women at seven, 70 cents on the dollar. But what happens is that's a negotiating tool for the women. So the women get the 70 cents and then they go, hey, I'm doing the job that that clown's doing over at, you know, so-and-so, the, 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 uh, the uh, racist or the, the sexist pig over there. Yeah, he's paying all the men. I want more money, or, or you know, I'm going over there. You know, in 
the problem with with setting wages by fiat by government is that you ruin people's negotiating. That you 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 take away that card uh, of negotiating. Um, that person, and also that you know when I was a kid, my uncle paid me nothing to come out to the farm and work for him on his farm. But I got experience. I I I learned how to interact with other workers. I learned how to to you know put on my boots and go to the barn. I learned how to get to work every day and be on time and uh, you know do all. Everybody thinks that if you go to school, you're just going to have all those skills. Well, you don't. And and uh, you know it's people come to Sodexo where I I work in the kitchen at the college doing the books there and. You, you know, you got to train them. I don't want to. So $15 an hour to train somebody? Uh, Non-binding, uh, Meg. Um, minimum wage to reach equilibrium. Okay. Release hold employers accountable for having a fair equilibrium wage, nevertheless. How, how do you find out the equilibrium? Um, I mean, you listen to uh, um, Murray Rothbard's, it's number three, the the third lecture on prices, and um, the problem is how, how if if who figures out what the equilibrium is, you're into the calculation problem. Is fifteen enough? Um, so it's tough. This is a trade-off. Uh, I think it illustrates a really interesting trade-off. It's better for everyone to have a job, but not have a livable wage, or for a few people that have jobs with a livable wage. Right, because the marginal wage is zero for the unemployed person. Uh, if you're printing money, it doesn't matter. Uh, so that's probably the way it'll go. Minimum wage won't solve poverty. Why? Well, because prices will rise to the minimum wage. Of course, we already learned about prices. We learned about supply and demand. Um, so that's what's going to happen. Uh, and here's where the BUI came in, right? Basic universal income. Thank you, Mr. Ja Jaffrey. Um, everyone would get a minimum amount of money from government a month. Uh, there, a lot of, there's been a lot of debate in, in uh, uh, libertarian circles about this as, because everyone agrees, you know, of course, that um, there's about, you know, the Matthew principle I mentioned in my last lecture. Uh, there's about 10% of the economy that, that people need our help. Um, they need some kind of charity. So how, how do you want to do that? Um, and, uh, you know, the BUI is, is I, I listened to, and I can't remember his name. I'm a big Dave Rubin fan. And Dave Rubin did an interview of uh, basic income, universal basic income. I can't remember who the universal basic, God, it's getting late, income. Uh, let me see if Dave Rubin, social justice, say this, Mark Unger. Oh, here he is, Andrew Yang. Oh, maybe here he is on Joe Rogan. That's where I heard it. If you want to hear uh, Yang give a really good, uh, it's this one's not the whole interview. It's only seven minutes, but he does. He, Rogan's great. He does like an hour with everybody. I, I think he got Andrew Yang for an hour, and and Yang is a smart guy, man. And uh, you know, I mean, he makes a great case. Um, I also listened to. Uh, you know, the case on the other side for that. Obviously, there's incentive problems. Um, everybody's, anytime you, you, you start to play around with this, you end up with calculation problems. So, um, uh, fraught with danger, you know, but nonetheless, there's got to be some way to shovel money down to people who need it. So, uh, it's not going to be perfect. Um, it looks like your UBI resonated with many of our classmates. Yeah, you see, it, it, it does. It makes it makes some sense. Uh, how would the government get the money to give to people monthly? Well, they have to steal it from someone. They have to take it from someone. 
Now, you can argue that they can print it and we only owe it to ourselves and all that. I hope I destroyed that argument with, with my talk about banking and fiat money. Um, but there's, there's a whole shitload of people that think I'm dead wrong about this. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I've taken it apart myself and I don't see it. Uh, I see a collapse in the dollar uh, coming up. But um, so far, I'm wrong. Uh, BUI, BUI, that's great. I'm so glad that, you know, this is why you put these discussions up because they, they head somewhere and then you're like, wow, that was really cool. Okay, uh, should the United States have a minimum wage? I'm a visual learner <laughs> and see the graph. <coughs> Ms. Danda, um, that's cool. Yeah, you, you can't, I mean, supply and demand is one of those things that hasn't been disproven um, you know, there's been iterations of, you, you see the straight lines of demand and supply, and I'm like, eh, they're not straight. But nonetheless, it's, it's a great illustration of how things work. Um, so you will get unemployment if you raise the wage too high. Uh, here's, oh, Trinity, Trinity's got us a, a graphic here, which I love. Uh, here's all the minimum wages everywhere. You, you freaking killed it here. Uh, but the direct cause of inflation no, for minimum wage is direct cause uh, for inflation, meaning price inflation. So uh, basically what you're saying is, oh, yeah, you raise the wage and then prices go up. So it just wipes out the wage increase. Um, you know, uh, the leading cause for a percentage spike in the 2009 was legalized lending of junk loans. <laughs> Anyway, that's great. Uh, you know, all these interventions in markets are a bad idea. Um, there's a long and lurid history of the minimum wage going back to the 1930s when it began, and I covered a little of that. Um, without a minimum wage, the financial aspect of the economy would ba basically cease to fluctuate and begin to bounce out or become more easily manageable naturally. Uh, historical impact of unions beginning in the late 1700s. Uh, it, it, that's an interesting angle. And, and this whole post, you know, read this post. It was very interesting. Uh, <laughs> Brian is like, wow, <laughs> being, uh, being on unemployment is different in the past. I did a, a, a for a stats class, an economics stats class, I did a an analysis of unemployment benefits. And I, I tried to figure, because it was after 2007, and I was trying to figure out uh, whether the benefits had any benefit at all or, or whether they were just a detriment, as you know, some real sort of conservative people would say. Um, and it turns out that anything after 16 weeks, according to my statistical analysis, is a waste of time. Um, you're just paying people to sit at home and eat Cheetos and I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I started off this lecture talking about the opioid crisis, and uh, there's a number of people like me who are addicts who eat opiates like they're going out of style. But then there's another group of people that aren't addicts who, who maybe, and this is a psychological argument. Maybe it's uh, some a lot of men who lost their jobs in 2008. And, uh, you know, building houses or doing whatever they were getting paid well and uh, their, their wives are working and they're sitting at home and they're eating Oxycontin because they feel bad about themselves. Uh, I can make a really good argument to that point. You're sitting at home eating Cheetos and, and uh, Oxys because they can't make the kind of money that they were. So now their back hurts and the doctors are only more, more than happy to... Uh, uh, give them those prescriptions. And if you, uh, I've been uh, on, uh, you know, talking with people about the opioid crisis and they say, well, it's these drug companies. And I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, we own our bodies. If you put shit in your body, it's on you. Uh, it's not on the drug company. They, you know, they make a drug and you have to take it. So um, we, that's what this country was based on was private property and you own your body. So if you think that um, I, the, the idea that a drug company gets fined by the government, I think it's just straight up wrong. 
they might suck and they might be despicable and all that, but you took the pill and drank. Um, minimum wage set standards and discourage ex exploitation, a blanketed approach, pl problematic. Yeah, you know, should, should be states. Uh, this is uh, this was all interesting, Braden. Um, and of course, uh, circling back the idea of forcing the money to come from upper management to investors. You know, I, I, you you looked at it from a really kind of uh, cool th cool angle. The other thing about morality is, uh, um, if you're making great dough, you should pay your people. I mean, that just. You know, when my dad cashed out, the people pushing the brooms in that building made a million dollars. You know, that, that's how it goes. Um, so, you know, that's why it's such a, a political football or, or, a, or an interesting topic, because what is the right thing to do? What is the right wage? You know, and, and someone, you know, in Washington says, well, it's $15, and I know. And I, I'm like, no, you don't. Um, p people get paid what they're worth, and uh, um, after that, if if you're making some incredible profit, uh, yeah, I agree. You have a moral, uh, a, a moral uh, uh, prerogative to to pay people and and do the be be good to your employees, and and capitalism is about that. This idea that that I don't know that capitalists are these monopoly figures that. You know, put their feet up on bags of money. It's just such a crock of shit. Um, these are good people. You know, they, they want to pay you more. Uh, you know, in, in certain cases, you, you, if you're in the restaurant business, you can't pay more. You, you, you're not making any money yourself, you know. You're milking cows like I was. You know, there's no money to pay $15 an hour. Uh, it just isn't. Um <laughs> so, yeah, Karen, don't apologize. You're good. The United States should not mandate it. If we dig further into these discussions, we're expected to deconstruct them and pull them apart. I've noticed that many responses often follow a common thread. Um, a previous study of psych, that's a good thing. Uh, you, you know, psych is very important to this, uh, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I was a moment of reflection in terms of earning, you know, I, uh, golden fried, boy, I, I worked at a fast food joint. Everybody should work at, you know, fast food joint is not where you stay. No one stays there. When you start talking about the, the quintiles of, of uh, earning, um, the upper quintile changes really rapidly, and so does the lower one. No one stays there, except maybe... In the Matthew principle, that ten percent of people that needs our help, and at their lower end, they're at the lower end of the, the distribution in IQ, and all that, and and they need our love and our help. Uh, Bree Young, always good. If the entire is a positive impact in poverty levels, the individual negative effect might outweigh them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I did enjoy. What did you say down here? Price floor in the, appears attractive because the federal wage grows. Consumer dis, disperse also increases, resulting in positive stimulation. Yeah, you know, and that's how they sell it. You know, they sell it to you like, oh, it'll be great. Every, you know, they'll spend the money, and um, this is this is why I want you to read Bastiat because no, it, it doesn't work that way because that money could have been reinvested by the business owner. You know, they had plans for that money. So now, instead of the baker having um, a window and a suit, he only has a window. And if you have to read the broken window fallacy to get that. Um, but it's a very important, it, it's a very, very important thing to understand. Um, what did I do here? Something weird. Anyway, um, that, I'm, I'm coming to the end. I talked for about an hour, just an hour on the dot. I just wanted to go through some of those responses and talk. So, I mean, you all know where I stand. Uh, minimum wage is a bad idea, and, and uh, there's a number of reasons, um, and I think I laid them out pretty succinctly. Um, and then I made fun of Krugman because 
again, I, I, I've had people say, well, you know, when he writes a magazine article or a blog, he's not held to the same standard as when he writes a textbook. And I'm going to call bullshit on that one. Um, I think you can square what I say with what I write. And, uh, and if it's something that I wrote earlier in my career, I'm the first to say I was wrong about that. Um, and, and I've, I've, you know, rethought it. I, I, I especially think it's funny when uh, whatever politicians, they always say, well, he or she.